Welcome to Noon Hour Slides from the Moostra Museum and Art Gallery. We're located on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional lands of the Blackfoot, Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We pay our respects to First Nations and Métis ancestors and reaffirm our relationship with one another. We gratefully acknowledge funding from the City of Moose Jaw, Sask Arts, Sask Culture, Saskatchewan Lotteries, Canada Council for the Arts, Canadian Heritage, and the Government of Canada. I'm Vincent O'Telling, the Administrative Assistant here. I'm here to welcome you to today's presentation. Rod Studd is here to talk about a trip to Chicago and some areas nearby. Welcome. Anyway, this of course is a map of the American Midwest and we uh, live in Saskatchewan, but most of my relatives are in Ontario. So over the last several decades, Elaine and I have driven across the Midwest uh, innumerable times um, and um, at least 50 going both directions. And sometimes we go right through the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and hardly stop, but other times we've, we've made an effort to stop at various places, visit friends, look at some sites. Uh, one year, for instance, we did go to see the bridges of Madison County. And um, I uh, decided I would uh, share some of these uh, the places we stopped with the, uh, with the art museum. And uh, two years ago, I started this, and uh, there's just too much stuff. I got started in the East with Buffalo and some places in Ohio and ended in Detroit. And um, so I'm going to continue what I then looking at some uh, smaller cities uh, in the central Midwest and with a big emphasis on Chicago. And um, I'll start by just doing a little bit of review of uh, what I did in the eastern part and then continue through the central part of the Midwest. Okay, so um, what we're looking at here is downtown Buffalo, and I don't know that anybody's got a real strong mental image of what Buffalo might look like. Uh, the building on the left is their city hall, the building on the right is a federal courthouse, and in the middle is an obelisk uh, uh, for President McKinley, who was assassinated in Buffalo in 1901. And they, they have some very substantial architecture. It's not something that we're conscious of today, but at one point Buffalo was the second wealthiest city in the United States because it was at the end of the Erie Canal. And so they had a huge uh, insurance industry and uh, industry involving um, uh, transportation and uh, shipping. And uh, it, it was an area that became very, very wealthy. Uh, one of the most important buildings in Buffalo is this one. It's the Guarantee Trust Building. And some people would say it is the first skyscraper in the world or certainly the first important one. It's designed by Louis Sullivan and uh, Guarantee Trust was one of those insurance companies. And uh, it was one of the first steel frame buildings, one of the first that was designed to look tall. And one of the things that I really like about it is it's entirely covered with ceramic tiles, which gives it a very highly decorated exterior. These were factory built tiles, so it was a, uh, Victorian uh, era industrialization. And this is one of the better examples. And here is the uh, Episcopal or Anglican Cathedral in Buffalo. And it is also an amazing building. Uh, and the uh, windows, stained glass windows are actually done by Tiffany. Uh, again, a sign of the wealth that the community had a uh, hundred years ago. And this is Cleveland. This is the river that famously caught on fire a few years back. Uh, and again, our image of Cleveland might not be something uh, of prosperity, but a uh, hundred years ago, it was one of your more prosperous cities and had one of the more uh, important art museums in the United States. And you can see the classical era style of this. This is the courtyard of this museum. and. Um, uh, I, I really think they've done an excellent job of combining the new museum with the old one. It, it, it's striking architecture. And of course, I always find architecture to be well worth uh, looking at. Another example of uh, 
architecture in Cleveland. This is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And it's designed by the famous architect I.M. Pei, the guy that did the pyramid at um, uh, the Louvre in uh, Paris. And I found Cincinnati to be a great walking city. Uh, here's an example, this cafe, uh, which has got a horse theme. All the menu items have to do with um, uh, triple crown horse races. And like Moose Jaw, Cincinnati has a very well-developed mural uh, in, and uh, program and uh, here are some of the ones that I thought were fairly creative. You can see the name on there. It's called the Over the uh, Rhine, uh, which is the name of the neighborhood. And it's an old German neighborhood in Cincinnati. And uh, then we went to Detroit. And this is the first Ford factory uh, dating from um, 19... 05. And uh, it was predates the development of the assembly line. This is where they made the early Ford cars. And what it is, is in each and every one of these bays that you had a separate work crew and the work crew would go all around the shop getting pieces and bring them back to the car in order to assemble it. And uh, this was where the Model T was invented. And then they opened the new assembly line. This is a Model T at the Henry Ford Museum. And, and it's an exploded, literally exploded view of this. Are, these are all original parts. And it shows how as the wheels would move forward, the chassis would go along the assembly line. Uh, the other parts would drop into place to be attached by the mechanics along the line. Uh, they build a Model T once a day there just to show how uh, easy it is to do with very basic tools and very basic knowledge because of the way the assembly line was working. And here's a place we didn't get to uh, because it was um, crowded and we would have needed to make a reservation in advance. This is the site of the Motown record industry where literally a guy working out of his home back in the 60s. Uh, started one of the biggest record companies in America. Everybody, Diana Ross, uh, Michael Jackson. And, and this is the art gallery, the Detroit Institute of Art. And this was famous because it was going to be sold. The city of Detroit had gone bankrupt and could not pay all of the pensions for all of the workers that had been there over many, many years because the tax base had declined. And some uh, accountant decided they should sell off their assets and they thought this would be one of the valuable ones to sell. Fortunately, uh, that caused a whole bunch of people to rise up in outrage and um, they managed to um, preserve this museum. Uh, it's allegedly the uh, sixth largest art gallery in the United States. And this is one of the more prominent things in its collection. This is a courtyard and these murals are by Diego Rivera. They're from dating from the 1930s. Uh, some people know that he, his wife um, uh, also was a famous artist, Frida Kahlo. And this is a series of murals honoring uh, the working class and, and, and industry. It's called Man and Machine. And one interesting thing is during the McCarthy era, the, the um, Republicans wanted to paint this over because they thought that it was promoting labor unions, which they disagreed with. And so the only way the museum managed to preserve it was by putting up a sign denouncing its political opinions, but praising it as representative of its era. Uh, so it, and it, of course it fills an entire room. It's one of the major works uh, in the United States by Rivera. I always, I, I cannot avoid architecture. I always like architecture. And uh, they did a very good job of uh, making the building accessible and enlarging it. 
in keeping compatible with its original style. And this is just a cross section. It's amazing. The uh, artwork that was from the Middle East. This is from Africa. You've got medieval. You've got the Romantic era. This is uh, 19th century. Uh, and then stuff from uh, very, very recent with indigenous and a very strong presence of African American art. Uh, so I'm very glad the museum uh, was not sold for, you know, to collectors all across the world. And uh, if you ever get to Detroit, it's very worth uh, spending some time. There's another example of some of the contemporary. And this is the courtyard where it's a, you can get a snack or a light lunch and uh, it makes for a very pleasant visit. Indianapolis, this is downtown Indianapolis. Um, that is the um, courthouse in the distance. And just in the right there is a war memorial, the sailors and uh, soldiers monument. This picture is taken from the um, new library, which I think has a very interesting lobby here and uh, letting the sunshine in in a uh, cold winter day. And on a summer day, uh, one of the big things is the Indiana State Fair, which we had the opportunity. And of course, it's very similar to things that we do here uh, in Moose Jaw and Regina. Indiana, Indianapolis has a very good art gallery. It does not have a lot of the older stuff that we saw in Detroit because it's a newer, smaller gallery, but a, their collection of contemporary art uh, is, I think, in, very impressive for a, a city, uh, you know, that's sort of medium size. This is me, obviously, and what I'm sitting on is a work of art. Those are thousands of clay figures that are holding up a plexiglass panel. And uh, the viewer is invited to go on top of the panel and you can look down and see their hands holding the, the panel up. The decorative arts is probably the thing that is most striking about the museum in Indianapolis. Here is a prototypical car. This is full size. Again, with the Indianapolis 500, they've got a very uh, prominent uh, automobile industry and an interest in cars. And some of these things, these you know, are just absolutely incredible designs. And other examples of the decorative arts uh, in this museum, uh, it's worth going just to see the decorative arts. The very, very large collection. And they have the largest sculpture garden, I imagine, anywhere. This is a map of it. It's 100 acres around the museum. And here are some examples of, uh, as you wander the, the paths of different uh, pieces of outdoor sculpture. And our dog enjoying a, a exhibition pavilion. Now, Indiana is the Indianapolis is the capital of the state of Indiana, and for some reason I never took a picture of the Capitol building. But I do have a picture of this, which is the former state capital in Corridon, Indiana, which is a small city, smaller than Moose Jaw, that's very close to the Ohio River. And this is where the capital was uh, in the early days. And Similarly, this is the former capital of the state of Illinois. This is in Visalia, Illinois, probably a place most people don't pay much attention to these days. And the current state capital in uh, Springfield, Illinois. And of course, it has the traditional form of a American capital building. 42, I think, of the 50 states have a capital with a dome, as of course is the legislature building in Regina. Uh, Frederick Douglass, very important uh, political figure in the history of Illinois. And farther north, this is the capital of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin. Classical style. And this, which is probably my favorite, is St. Paul, Minnesota. And I really love the horses and chariots on the uh, top of that, their entrance. Other places in Minneapolis, which is the twin city of St. Paul, uh, obviously I don't have time to do a thorough uh, 
uh, presentation of every city, but I'm just going to look at some of the highlights. And one of the things with Minneapolis is it is the center of the grain growing industry and was very, very wealthy uh, due to that. And this is the lobby of the um, Weston Hotel, which in 1941 was designed as an Art Deco style bank. And it is, again, an amazing interior uh, with period furniture and it's been totally restored. Another building is the flower exchange, like a um, stock market, but uh, focusing especially on the grain industry. And Minneapolis was the center of the flour milling uh, part of that industry. And they have a uh, museum called the Mill City Museum, the which is an 1870s era flour mill that has been converted to a museum about the history of um, the grain industry and flour milling. So there's some of the old wooden machinery that they used and uh, other th things related to the uh, flour industry, a Bisquick display. And I don't know who remembers the Easy Bake Oven. Uh, some of us that were older might remember that. And uh, this is, again, one of the reasons uh, that um, Minneapolis is where all this is located. It is where the railway met the Mississippi River. The, the, the uh, Mississippi, you usually think of New Orleans or Memphis or St. Louis, but the headwaters are in Minnesota. And St. Anthony Falls was the end of the navigation. You couldn't get past St. Anthony Falls. And so the river boats would go up that far. And then originally Red River carts and wagon trains, and then eventually the railroad uh, connected at Minneapolis and went west. Uh, you'll notice that it says um, Red River Valley, uh, and uh, it actually uh, is the um, St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Manitoba Railway. And one little known thing is the first railway in Western Canada was not the Canadian Pacific, but was in fact the, the route through Minneapolis. And a lot of the construction equipment used to make the Canadian Pacific came up from Minneapolis by that railway. And here is the old railway uh, stone arch bridge. And you can see uh, St. Anthony Falls and Rapids and the Pillsbury flour mill. Minneapolis has some statues around downtown. This is one near the baseball stadium. And uh, you can see how much fun that is when you go to a game. And of course, the most famous might be the statue of Mary Tyler Moore based on her television show that uh, took place in Minneapolis. Milwaukee is an amazing city. Uh, it's got more museums within walking distance than almost any place else. There are at least six museums within downtown within a few blocks of each other. This is the Brewing Museum. And we have some beer trays from uh, some of their original Milwaukee beer companies. And this is Milwaukee. One of the things, if you compare Milwaukee to say Chicago, which we're going to look at next, is Chicago was a boom place. It was a prosperous place. Milwaukee was prosperous a hundred years ago. And then like Moose Jaws, uh, fell on hard times. And like Moose Jaw, therefore they never tore down any of the old buildings in order to build new skyscrapers. And it's got one of the best uh, sandstone granite uh, architecture anywhere. This style is known as Romanesque, obviously, because of the round arches and the very heavy construction reminiscent of uh, European castles. And one, I'm not going to look at all the museums, but one of the museums which I thought was very interesting, the Milwaukee uh, School of Engineering, and you wouldn't expect an engineering school to have an art museum, but they have a museum that is dedicated to uh, showing art that represents industry. 
And so these are some statues on the roof garden of that museum with these people representing different uh, working trades uh, as they were in the early part of the 20th century. And this is just a cross section. They've got paintings from around the world. The thing that is consistent is they all represent different trades and crafts. So very unique collection. And again, who would have thought at an engineering school glass blowing. Another small museum is the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. It's an art school uh, said to be one of the smallest college campuses <laughs> in the state. Uh, and here's uh, some of the stuff, some of the student work in the uh, museum of the art school. And again, something you might not expect, this is a river that flows through the middle of the city of Milwaukee and it's absolutely a, a charming. There's a uh, sculpture walk along the edge of the river and a variety of different pieces of uh, public art. This is some public art in the foreground. In the background you have uh, what is actually the uh, Milwaukee Art Museum. And it is a amazing uh, construction by the Spanish architect Santiago Calatrava. And uh, some of the collection, a, a lot of American art. Some very interesting styles. This one's by Dufy, a French artist. And again, Calatrava's museum. Contrast that uh, to Chicago, and this is probably an image many people have. It's uh, known as City of Broad Shoulders. It's a gritty industrial heartland city. Uh, we're underneath the L, the famous elevated railroad that goes around in downtown Chicago, the uh, public transportation system. But it also has some amenities that make it a very pleasant place to be. And this is uh, a, a canal. It's an actual river that drains uh, into the Lake Michigan and it has been developed along the sides of it. Uh, some very beautiful places to walk and you can take a boat tour. And uh, you've got uh, restaurants and, uh, and other things along there. The round building just to the center left, that's Trump Tower. Uh, and uh, in more interest in the distance is the Wrigley Building which was uh, the Wrigley Chewing Gum Company. Here's one of the sidewalk uh, restaurants along the side of the canal and a closer view of the clock tower on the Wrigley building. This is uh, Michigan Avenue and uh, the facades at Base Lake Michigan across the park. And these are some uh, very impressive buildings. The colored building in the background, the blue one is actually a university building. And then the other one is a office building. Chicago is like a museum of architecture. It's got uh, probably one prominent building, one of the most prominent buildings in the world for virtually every decade since the late 19th century. This is the Congress Hotel, obviously. Uh, and um, it was built in 1893 because they had a World's Fair there. Uh, they had a big fire in, in, in the uh, late 1880s. And so they did a big campaign to rebuild the city. And part of the sort of kickoff of the new city was the World's Fair in 1893, allegedly to commemorate the arrival of Columbus in the West Indies, which has nothing to do with Chicago, but it was a great excuse to um, rebuild the city and open it to the world. Chicago theater won a classic landmark. 
Berghoff Restaurant, again, one of the early German restaurants dating from the 1890s. It's uh, been sort of the archetypical Chicago restaurant ever since. And I look at the elevated railway, the L, and it snakes through downtown. And, uh, you know, people make do with it. It becomes an aesthetic feature. And some of the, uh, again, on Michigan Avenue, some of the uh, views along the sidewalk. This, as some of you may recognize, is a stable by Alexander Calder. Its name of this particular work is Flamingo. And it is in downtown Chicago on this plaza. Chicago has a lot of uh, urban art. Uh, this horse, for example, is We have a cow here that, uh, again, was part of the um, bronze cow is uh, from 1999. The statue in the back, the fountain, dates back to 1913. And these are the lion statues that are uh, in front of the Chicago Institute of Art. and. Uh, they date to 1894, and uh, when the Blackhawks are in the playoffs, they uh, show their loyalty. Looking up, again, Chicago is a city of skyscrapers, a sense of rivaling New York City. At one point, they were seen to be the leading city in the world. Most of the tall skyscrapers are now being built in Asia, but... Uh, Looking up, you see, again, a, a classic architecture, amazing work by a variety of people. I love the reflections off the glass ones onto the brick buildings. And another iconic thing about uh, Chicago buildings are the exterior sky, uh, fire escapes. Go up dozens and dozens of floors. Work of art in themselves. As I say, Chicago is like a museum of architecture, and they indeed do treat it that way. This is an architectural model that is in the uh, Chicago Architecture Foundation. And uh, the building on the left, the one with the two cylinders, is called um, the, um, I forget what it's called. I'll come back to that. Um, Marina Towers, and uh, it, it's a, a very interesting building. I'm going to look at it more closely in, in a few minutes. Uh, this is the tour guide at the Architecture Center, or one thereof, leading a tour. And you can see from the scale of the space, they've got a huge model of the city of Chicago that they can use to illustrate things, plus a whole bunch of other architectural exhibits around the building. Here are some close-up pictures of the model and a city of uh, a map showing some of the prominent buildings in downtown. You can see the river or canal as it goes through the middle of downtown. And here is a periodic table, again, as uh, taking advantage of the fact that there are uh, prominent buildings representing virtually every decade of um, urban architecture in the United States. So following the tour, one of the things is, this is the Monadnock building. And uh, it is a, um, and some people say uh, the first skyscraper or the last skyscraper, depending on your definition. And what it is, is the tallest load bearing office building in the world. Uh, there is no steel frame in this building, and it's 14 stories high. And um, it, at the time it was built, was also the largest office building in terms of the um, amount of floor space in a single building. There are some towers, such as Philadelphia City Hall, and maybe some church towers that are made out of load-bearing stone, but they're not occupied spaces as this building is all the way to the top. In order to support that load, the walls at the bottom have to be six feet 
thick. Uh, this takes up a lot of floor space. It's not a very cost effective way to build. And that's why the steel frame that again was pioneered in Chicago uh, became a prominent in the construction of architecture. This is in fact a steel frame building, although it's got the Romanesque exterior. Uh, it is the auditorium building. It uh, is by the architect Louis Sullivan and it dates from 1889. And uh, it's one of the uh, classic uh, Victorian, well, they don't call it Victorian in the United States, but it's of the arts and craft, um, Art Nouveau style buildings. And it is now part of the Roosevelt University, as is this building, which is next door to it. And again, you can see this very traditional early Chicago style of the, um, what they called Richardsonian Romanesque after the architect H.H. Uh, H. Richardson. But what we're looking at here is what is really the Chicago style of architecture. And these are steel frame buildings and you can see very, very large windows. And in these days uh, when these were built and electricity was not as efficient and uh, as it is today, uh, the large windows allowed people to work in a high density part of the city. And these would not only be office buildings, you'd have light industry such as, you know, they'd make shirt collars or do stationery or buttons, all sorts of industries that, of course, uh, were the Chicago being the center of manufacturing for the whole Midwest. And uh, the... Um, uh, Hammond building here in Moose Jaw is a very good example of a Chicago style building. This is the um, Athletic Association building and it is one of the famous downtown Chicago club. The, um, these would be businessmen's clubs and in those days it would be men. Uh, Chicago it was the center of the rail uh, and we're talking freight, but people took advantage of this and, and wealthier people started living out in small farm towns and commuting in on the railroad. And that of course ended up creating suburbs. And the people who came from those areas, they did not have enough time at lunch to go downtown, go back home for lunch. And therefore, uh, a lot of these private clubs where business people would meet for lunch or meet after the work in order to exchange gossip and make business deals and probably good excuses to eat and drink. What we're looking at here is the Marquette building. And this is, although much taller, is very similar to the Hammond building we have here in Moose Jaw. It's again, one of your beautiful examples of the use of ceramic tile as an architectural element. It's named for the French Canadian explorer Marquette who was the first European in this area. And some other examples of the very prominent uh, architecture of that 1890s era. The building on the left is known as the National a former National Bank building. You can see the uh, way in which the skyscrapers were, had three parts. They were like a classical column. They had a base, they had a shaft, and then they had a capital at the top. And each part of the building would be designed distinctly. Again, some of these elements, there's just too many to go into all the details. This building is very interesting. It is the Reliance building, and it is, again, entirely covered with terracotta. And because of the steel frame, you've got almost entire facade of windows. So, a, uh, again, the, a next generation. So, you know, getting away from that heavy Romanesque into a lighter style. This is the Board of Trade building. It's an Art Deco style building dating from the 1930s. And again, every decade you've got a building that is representative of the style of that era. Statue of Ceres, who is the Roman god of grain. And again, wheat and grain being a very big part of Chicago's industry.
after the deco, the mid-century modern era, which of course is represented by Calder and by this building, which has, it's the Federal Office Building, which is a very ordinary sounding name, but the architect is Mies van der Rohe, one of the major uh, mid-century modern architects, and it dates from 1965. And he, he, he believed that less is more and uh, his buildings have this sort of uh, geometric simplicity and a lot of reflective glass. Even at that time, uh, people were very critical of this as being relatively boring. And uh, this is why buildings such as this, which is the um, Inland Steel Company building of 1956. You can see much more, uh, even though it's a lot of glass windows, a much more uh, textured facade. And back to the Marina City, uh, 1963. And this building is not steel, but concrete. And uh, you can see the uh, concrete balconies coming off of each floor as part of a very, very textured look. You can see the parking below so that this was an entire, this was intended to entice people back from the suburbs. You could park your car uh, in the parking ramp and uh, live uh, at, in the top and of course all the shops and so on that you needed would be in the shopping mall at the base. And then it, it was right over at the side of the canal. Again, reflections of buildings in other buildings create an interesting effect. This used to be known as the John Hancock building. It's now got a very boring address of um, 875 North Michigan is the official name of this building while it waits a corporate sponsor. You can see the external framework and it at one point was the second tallest building in the world. 1984, you can see the expressive geometry of these buildings and this building in the background uh, topped all of them. It was then known as the Sears Tower and when it was built, it was the tallest building in the world, taller than anything in New York. Uh, there are several buildings in Asia that are taller than it is, but it, it again, in terms of um, architecture of the late 20th century, this is one of your uh, most important buildings. And then of course we start getting into the postmodern and this again Roosevelt University and the CNA office building in these bright colors. And I love this. It's a map of Chicago on the side of one of the buildings and you can see the red dot there that um, it shows the location of the building in question. And this is right when you walk out of Union Station. You get off the train and you've got a map to orient yourself as part of the architecture. Uh, some of the, again, more distinctive sculptural architecture, the late 20th and 21st centuries. The, love the zigzag through there. Uh, some of the expressive facades on these things. This is one of my favorite buildings. It's the Aeon uh, building, which is an insurance company. It used to be the Standard Oil building. Uh, and then it was named Amico when the oil company changed its name. And then the, they got bought by British Petroleum and the head office moved away and they no longer are associated with this building. Uh, but it looks very tall and it's concrete all the way up. The windows are de-emphasized compared to the buildings of the mid-century. And you can see behind it, just to the right, is one of um, the most recent buildings. It's from 2009. It's called Aqua. It looks like a waterfall from a distance. And it's got a lot, as you can see, cantilevered concrete balconies, and they're in a pattern so that the shadows cast move and change and the reflections off it as the sun moves through the day. Uh, the architect, her name was Jean Gang. This is said to be the tallest building uh, designed by a woman in the world. Uh, I think it's also one of the most beautiful. Looking at the interiors, this is the Sullivan Auditorium building uh, in the um, Romanesque style. And you can see the ornate um, Art Nouveau uh, metalwork and uh, glasswork, plasterwork, tile work. And this is part of the former Chicago Library, which has been turned into a cultural center when the library moved to a new building. Uh, and again, absolutely amazing uh, Tiffany Dome.
1890s era building. And some other interiors from this space. That's a beautiful corner office location overlooking the park. Another type of building, I talked about how the men would congregate at the men's clubs for lunch. Uh, their wives would come in from the suburbs to do shopping during the day. And uh, obviously the ones who had money would go to the more elegant places. This is the Marshall Field department store. And um, it uh, is designed uh, not only to sell merchandise, but the restaurants and uh, uh, fit, uh, places with fashion shows and all of these other things that were intended to uh, create an elegant lifestyle for the uh, rising middle class in Chicago. And Chandelier, this is a department store. Look at the ceiling. It's just absolutely incredible. And this is the interior of the Monadnock building, the one that was the uh, masonry building. And one of the things about it from 1891, it's one of the first examples of aluminum in, as an architectural material. Uh, the building was so heavy that the stairs had to be very light. The Rookery building, another office building from the 1880s, the lobby was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, it's got a lot of his signature, uh, again, arts and craft, Art Nouveau uh, type of design. At some point, they did a renovation back in the mid 20th century and covered up some of Frank Lloyd Wright's work, which seems weird. Uh, and so they exposed part of one of the columns so people could see what it, the original would have looked like. One of his lighting designs. And in the um, Art Deco style, this is the field building. A lot of uh, streamlined metal work. And mid-century modern, we're back to the inland steel building. This, which is the uh, concierge desk, uh, Frank Gehry, our prominent architect, uh, designed that as a piece of furniture. So we're uh, now um, looking at some of the street sculpture again. This is by Picasso. It's called Untitled by Picasso. And some other examples, very, very good signage explaining the architecture to people who aren't taking official tours. I um, This is cute with the walking the alligator. This is, uh, Fernet Branca is an Argentine liquor that is no, Italian, but very popular in Argentina, and it's being promoted in Chicago. Elaine and I cannot find it in Saskatchewan. We did find some in Alberta, but it's very good with Coca-Cola. And uh, another sign on the street, the um, beginning of historic U.S. Route 66. It starts at the Art Museum in Chicago and ends on the amusement pier in Santa Monica, California. So this is the uh, beginning of the road. You can't go to Chicago without seeing the Cubs. Wrigley Field is the oldest stadium in the major leagues and you just can't do this anymore. For the first thing, it doesn't have a lot of parking. You've got to get there by public transit and it's right up in a residential neighborhood and so the streets just get crowded with people as they arrive for the game. And inside, you can't do this. This is it violates almost every building code that you can imagine today. Uh, they, they have catwalks to get to the upper decks. People sit all over the place. I don't know how the fire codes would tolerate this. And then of course, half the time the field is obscured. You can see the television screen so you can see the parts, the play that you're missing. Uh, but the fans just love their uh, team. They'll they'll support it. 
uh, even uh, winning or losing, uh, good views or not. These are some of the better views if you're at the front of the upper deck. And if you notice, a, even beyond the stadium, you can see there are fans over the roof of adjacent apartment buildings. And these up the side of the scoreboard. Uh, just absolutely amazing place. And of course, when the game's over, there's not a lot of uh, place in the stadium. So again, they flood the streets. Uh, the L, of course, is super crowded with 30,000 people trying to board it. So nobody even bothers. You just uh, go support a local merchant. This is a Chicago style hot dog, by the way. And this is the Chicago Art Institute, and it's said to be the third largest art museum in the United States. Uh, and it is one that is large enough that it is what they call an encyclopedic collection. Um, this is Christie, who was in Chicago celebrating a birthday. And uh, I happened to be passing through on my way to Toronto. And so we got together and um, of course we went to the art museum. And uh, this is, as I say, probably the one of the best museums in the United States. And it's one of the closest in, of a collection of this nature uh, to where we live in Saskatchewan. So it's well worth visiting. You will get to see paintings that you only saw in books. This is an El Greco, uh, Monet. You probably thought these were in Europe. This is a street in Paris. Uh, ballet dancer by uh, Degas. Uh, Self-portrait by Van Gogh. These are these are in, these are not in Europe. These are in Chicago. This is a Renoir. I felt for sure that this was another Degas, but no, Toulouse-Lautrec. So that shows you how much you can tell by looking. And yes, this is an original Van Gogh. And yes, there is one in Paris. He did more than one. This is his bedroom in Arles. Uh, Van Gogh, not well known for doing uh, people, but this is a Van Gogh people painting. And this one, uh, is by Voyard, Monet, and then of course there's so much else and I have no idea who, like a lot of this stuff dates from uh, all over the place. That's a Wedgwood, that's a Tiffany, more Wedgwood. American collection, Grant Wood, the um, American Gothic. And sometimes you can get too much of a good thing. Uh, if you can see through the crowd, that's Whistler's mother. Uh, medieval, Oriental, there's a beautiful dragon. That is a Picasso before he went abstract. And they even have a permanent architecture display. It's a changing display, but uh, a room that's always dedicated to architecture. Himalayan, uh, that's uh, Derobia. That's a Roman copy of a Greek original. I don't know, but I like it. Uh, part of their decorative arts collection, their Asian room. Uh, again, you should spend the whole day there. They have a lovely little uh, cafeteria. And if it's not raining, you can eat outside. They have seating on the roof garden. And across the garden, that's Millennial Park, uh, of course, dating to 2000. Uh, you're seeing the top of the Pritzker uh, uh, Music built, uh, Pavilion and some of the buildings of Chicago behind. And um, This is seen from the modern wing of the art museum, which of course is a very different vibe than other places. This is, I don't remember who it's by, but again, some modern art of a, this is John Singer Sargent, who's one of my favorite artists. 
as is this, which doesn't look at all like what people might expect. He was known as a portraitist. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe. This is by E.J. Motley, Mark Chagall, very famous painting by Hopper, known as Nighthawks. And another Van Gogh, before he sort of got too expressive, this is a lookout from Momart. And, and there's a more traditional John Singer Sargent portrait. Matisse, a uh, couple of American paintings, the very different character of the modern wing. And I am now going to conclude by looking at the park that surrounds the art museum. And they've got some parts of it that are left to be wild. Uh, in a sort of natural state, which I really like. And some other parts are more formal. This is built over an old railway yard. I have always argued that in favor of dense construction, taller buildings, because density creates open space by um, Building up where they build up, they leave the rest of the space available to get closer to nature. You probably uh, are familiar with this fountain if you've seen the opening scenes of the um, Married with Children. This is a fountain and sculpture called the Crown Fountain. Some of the buildings in the distance. This is a sculpture known as Cloud Gate from 2004 and it's reflective and reflects the buildings beyond. And of course it attracts people all over the place taking pictures of themselves and uh, some amazing distortions. And um, this is the park in use. This is the Chicago Blues Festival. Similar to say the Regina Folk Festival, but larger. But just a wonderful place to spend time in the city. Uh, something in contrast to the sort of grittiness that you might associate with Chicago. Uh, Chicago, as I say, is uh, one of the great American cities. It's one of the closest to Saskatchewan. And I uh, highly recommend if you have an opportunity uh, that you take that chance to visit it. And I will conclude right there. <laughs>